uh, program. My name is Norman Ostick. I'm with the Lessons of the 60s Project. And I also want to thank our other co-sponsors uh, tonight of this, of this event, uh, DC Jobs with Justice, Empower DC, uh, in Super Policy Studies, and the Ivy City Civic Association. You'll be hearing more about them uh, as we go along. Uh, I just want to say a couple words about the Lessons Project. Uh, and uh, you know, why we're doing it, what we're doing. I don't think I have to say to the folks here that the 1960s and early 1970s was a time of great change, great ferment in this country, uh, major mass movements, uh, a lot of time of hope, not sometimes disappointments as well. And a lot of that's been documented and written about. Our focus is, is a little more narrow. We're looking at what happened here in Washington, D.C. during that time period. The, act, the activities for peace and justice that were going on locally, not necessarily part of the, the national movement. And to, uh, to that end, we, uh, we have started a project. We are doing uh, oral interviews with people who, who were active during that period. We are planning a website. We're looking to collect materials, post materials, uh, documents, uh, newspapers that were published during that period, uh, all, kind of, all kinds of materials. Uh, we're also working uh, to establish an archive at a local library. Uh, and we're hoping to have that uh, implemented in the near future. So we're looking, we're going to be looking for materials. And uh, so if anyone is interested in any of, of what we're trying to do first, just make sure before you leave, you can get a copy of our mission statement to get more information. We have a sign-up sheet here if you would like to be kept informed of what we're doing. And if anyone is interested in getting involved and working with us, we would welcome that. Uh, you can see me, you can see Ann uh, after the uh, program is over. Uh, and with that, I want to just uh, turn it over to our moderator, John Hanrahan. John is a writer. He's a former reporter for the Washington Post. He's a former executive director of the Fund for Investigative Journalism. So, John. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Norman. Um, just want to thank everybody for turning out here tonight, and uh, uh, we, I think we have a really terrific discussion in store for you uh, on the topic of what does it take to save a neighborhood these days. <clears throat> and before I uh, introduce the panelists, I want to thank uh, Eddie Becker, our uh, cinematographer extraordinaire, uh, who will be filming tonight uh, for our archives and uh, for the possibility of it being shown on DC community television at some point uh, soon. Uh, so let's get to it. We have five panelists here tonight. They'll each speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for uh, general discussion, and, and including questions from the audience and further discussion among the panelists. So I'm sure we'll have many other things to say that they won't be able to get into their uh, 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, would be, uh, I'll introduce all five of them briefly and then in more detail later. Uh, Angela Rooney is um, as down here on my right. Uh, she's from uh, Brookland. She's a neighborhood activist who was one of the instrumental figures in the emergency committee on the transportation crisis back in the 60s and 70s, uh, ECTC uh, for short, the Anti-Freeway Coalition. Uh, Arisa Naruzi of Empower DC. Uh, Arturo Griffiths down at the, uh, the end there from DC Jobs with Justice. And uh, Derek Neighbors. Uh, Amalgamated Transit Union, Union Local 689. And as I said, I'll tell you a little bit more about each of them as we, uh, uh, before they begin their prepared remarks. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Angela Rooney, who will discuss the extraordinary and successful anti-freeway fight that pitted, pitted citizens in a unique coalition of black and white, rich and poor, and everyone in between, African American, working class homeowners, and Georgetown matrons against a powerful array of pro-highway interests pushing for more and more freeways. The Washington Post, the Washington Star, the Board of Trade, 
the DC Highway Department, the American Automobile Association, the Greater Washington Central Labor Council, the Washington Trucking Association, Automotive Trade Association, the Capital, National Capital Transportation Agency, and then the most powerful uh, Southern Congressman who held the city hostage up to the freeway threat for uh, many years because he had control over district affairs. And for those of you who came by Metro tonight, you have Angela and the ECTC to thank. Uh, that, would have been, that would have been a freeway. Uh, don't ask me which one it was. It's the North Central. I guess that's, I do know that. Um, she, uh, Angela, uh, in her earlier uh, days, was an actress and artist, and then uh, in later years, a housewife for turning her attention to the great uh, freeway fight. And over the years, she has continued her uh, activism in various community and environmental causes and remains uh, active today, particularly in the effort to preserve the uh, McMillan Reservoir in Brookland as a, a park uh, rather than uh, commercial or other awful development. And I wouldn't be surprised if she mentioned something about that later in the evening. Uh, she was, uh, the freeway projects of that era were, were, had such names as the North Central Freeway, the Northeast Freeway, and the Three Sisters Bridge. Uh, and behind us, you'll see a map that uh, Angela and her husband Tom uh, brought where you could examine it uh, further at, uh, you know, after the meeting, perhaps. And I passed out a number of packets of some very poorly reproduced uh, little maps from the uh, internet, which, but which give you an idea of how the uh, freeways would have cut from Tacoma Park, Brookland, down through Shaw, DuPont Circle, Washington Circle, and then uh, Georgetown. And with the exception of Georgetown, neighborhoods uh, then were, most of those neighborhoods were predominantly African American when DC was more than 70% black. Uh, Angela on the ECTC um, was involved, uh, was, was headed by a prominent uh, activist, Reginald Booker, and vice chairs uh, are names of people that you might recognize, uh, Marion Barry, uh, DC's mayor for life, uh, Julius Hobson, uh, great civil rights uh, figure of the 1960s and 70s, uh, Charles Cassell, uh, school board and uh, uh, chair of the Constitutional Convention, and then probably, as far as uh, uh, a lot of us are concerned, Sammy Abbott, who later was mayor of Tacoma Park and was described by the Washington Post as a firebrand of the old school, who was arrested some 34 times protesting the freeways. Uh, Angela, I know, will tell us more about Sammy, who was a great inspiration to her and was the, really the driving force of that organization. Uh, as I mentioned, that the uh, freeways would have uh, uh, cut through areas that were predominantly black, and, and ECTC estimated that 90% of the thousands of houses that would be seized and destroyed to make way for the freeways were owned or occupied by African Americans. And this inspired numerous Sammy Abbott posters and flyers with the slogan uh, to stop white men's roads through black men's homes. <coughs> homes excuse me. Uh, so there, besides the uh, this community organizing, street protests, nonviolent direct action, people who tie themselves to trees and lie down in front of bulldozers at the Three Sisters Bridge, uh, un un unboarding uh, houses in uh, Brookland that were targeted for destruction, and raucous demonstrations at uh, city council meetings, which uh, I know Angela uh, has some good uh, stories about. Uh, besides all that, there was, there was pro bono attorneys from the uh, 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 Covington and Burling, who waged an ultimately successful fight to halt uh, all freeway construction. And sadly and ironically, uh, Covington and Burling is on the other side of a, of a community fight in Ivy City that we'll hear about later on. Uh, just to sum up here, a piece in the Washington Post, November 26, 2000, uh, Bob Levy and Jane Freundell Levy uh, made these uh, comments. <clears throat> There was a time when the Washington area was supposed to have 450 miles of interstate highways. About 38 of those miles were supposed to pass through the District of Columbia. But because of an epic political battle that lasted 22 years, only 10 were ever built, and all were finished before protests against them started in earnest. Instead, the Washington area got Metro, all $5 billion and 103 miles of it. The struggle to block freeway building 
wrench local politics between 1954 and 1976 like no other issue involving public protests, court decisions, presidential level politics, and cooperation between the races that would have been extraordinary in any other area. Could an unlikely coalition of blacks and whites block freeways that they didn't want in a town without any representation in Congress or heavyweight uh, political experience? It happened. Today, Washington has fewer miles of freeways within its borders than any other major city on the East Coast. Tens of thousands of housing units were saved from destruction. So were more than 100 square miles of parkland around the metropolitan area. The city was spared from the freeways board under the mall. Freeways punched through stable middle class black neighborhoods. Freeways tunneled under K Street. Freeways that would have obliterated the Georgetown waterfront and the Maryland Bank of the Potomac. Angela Rooney knows all about this and more, and we have her and so many others to uh, thank that were largely free of destructive freeways uh, instead of, uh, we look like Washington, D.C. instead of, say, Atlanta. And uh, mm -hmm. Angela, it's a privilege to uh, have you, you here John. tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm going to stand. Can you hear me? Yes. You have the mic. OK, back there? Yes. Sure? Yes. OK. I, I'm much better on my feet. I mm -hmm. just don't feel right sitting down. And I'm talking to friends. I thought I would be you know, bringing new stuff to new people. Um, as John said, I started in 1961. And it was a shock to me to find out what was happening. Uh, boy, I have a lot of people in my mind now who should be here and who should be talking to you. They're in a better place. They were with me for years, and I learned a lot with them, and they learned a lot. Uh, all of a sudden, I understood I-95 in all its glory with ramps and exits and so forth was going to come right through between where the tracks are. And uh, I was stunned. I wrote a letter to Tobriner. We had no elected officials to speak of at all, none really. And I got a little letter back that shocked me. Oh, it's going to be good for you. You're going to love it. Uh, I, at the same time, I heard that there was a public hearing in Tacoma Park. I didn't know much about it, but I thought, I'll go and see what happens. I walked in. They gave me some testimony. They said, this woman can't come. Will you get up and read it for her? And I did. And I read it, and I thought, this is good stuff. And that was where I probably met Sam Abbott and the people in Tacoma Park. And by a sort of process of osmosis, we glommed together. Sam was fantastic. He was a born natural leader, a born uh, political analyst, a born worker beyond belief, and uh, people around the city who were becoming aware. For instance, the uh, Federation of Civic Associations and a few others, a taxi driver, someone who was almost nobody but who didn't like the idea. And we began meeting at 14th Street and Lawrence. And we kept meeting there for years. <laughs> it was our headquarters. The Presbyterian Church was very nice. John Moat, who was the pastor, welcomed us. We had a wonderful time meeting there because we were learning all together and a lot of it from Sam. He did that map. He was within one month, I think, or maybe a year, of becoming an architect at Cornell and he could not bear social injustice. And he began organizing under that with the unions came here as a, an architect, not an architect, but as a commercial artist, and continued his love of social justice. And this was his big cause at the time, and it spread. What do you do when you're trying to condense 15 at least years of heavy, constant meeting on a big issue in a city that is so cowed and afraid and has no government. It was tough. We had to deal directly with the Department of the Federal Highway Administration. There was no DOT. 
and they were a very interesting bunch of guys with tunnel vision. And I used the word tunnel before they ever built one, but they had tunnel vision about highways. They could not think, see, or imagine a city that was not going to be gridded over. In fact, the whole country was at that point under the grid of farmland, everything. All cities were supposed to be inundated with freeways connecting all over the world, all over the world if they could do it. So, um, God, where do you start? Where do you get to the point that would be of interest to you? Um, most of you probably remember some of this. It was very, very strong that uh, we were a fractured bunch of communities, very individual. You know, there was Georgetown, then there was east of the park, west of the park, south, north, all of that. And the job was to educate everybody. And that is the key word. I know that you use it. I know you all use it. So I'm not, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but believe me, at that point, people hadn't bothered with education. You couldn't trust the post. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know you can trust the post. You can't trust it now, and you couldn't trust it then. Uh, you have to do your own homework. You have to do your own finding out of facts. You have to find who's doing what, where, and how, just like a good newspaper man would, and then translate it for everybody, and you all share. You all work. Um, we were, give or take one year or another, um, pretty successful in organizing, enough so that we attracted attention. The FBI took note of us. We were uh, cataloged, our phones were tapped, we couldn't do a thing without someone knowing. So that brings us to another issue, keep it squeaky clean. We never met individually, we met as large a group as we could bring to whatever meeting it was, and we always acted under one uh, law-abiding principle, which which was, first, not another inch of freeways. And that shocked people like crazy. They couldn't believe we would take a stand like that. But when we finished, or continued to educate, they understood why. There's no such thing as a piece of freeway, any more than you'd be a little bit pregnant, you know? You cannot do it. So Sam was right. And we believed, and we fought that. And it was truly, in this city, a real social justice issue. It was black and white all the way, because the freeway, if you may not have known it, was scheduled to come down Wisconsin Avenue. And of course, Wisconsin Avenue would not have it. So they went back to the drawing board, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll find a place. And they decided Northeast was perfect all black, pretty much, and easy to uh, manipulate. Which brings me to something interesting, because I don't know if very many people, except those who were deeply involved, knew about it. But we were, um, we really made them work hard to continue pushing freeways, which they insist on doing, no matter what. And, uh, at one point, and I couldn't give you the date, oh, it's here somewhere. I brought it with me. Um, the Federal Highway Administration hired a behavioral scientist <laughs> to figure out how to turn a community around. Congressman Stratton in New York got wind of it, read it, and said, Where's the effect? This is the most undemocratic thing I have ever read in my life. 13 steps to force a community to accept a free one. And he put it into the congressional record. Great. We had it copied, and we sent it all over the country, everywhere we could find a win or hear of a public hearing to be held. And, uh, I happened to listen 
to the radio one day when I'm not a radio person, but uh, I did hear this by sure accident. Uh, the AIA, American Institute of Architects, um, took the 13 steps to heart. And they used their trainees, their young students, and uh, in Baltimore, they found them out at Bell's Point. And there was an interview with the students and a woman, knock on the door, in the Bell's Point area, where it's primarily Polish. And the question was, now, Mrs. So-and-so, we understand that you really would like a new school. Now, would you like your school to the left of the freeway, to the right of the freeway, or maybe over the freeway? <laughs> Done. If she answers, she's dead in the water. They did that with the Three Sisters Bridge and the League of Women Voters. A wonderful meeting being held in the heat of summer, as August can be like. We raced back from vacation, a short one, not too far away, because we couldn't bear to be away. And uh, we went to the hearing, and I thought, well, this is going to be good. I was ready to testify. And uh, they called up the woman who represented the League of Women Voters. And they said, now, Mrs. So-and-so, after she had made her short statement, um, of all the plans, we have come down to plan A, plan B, or plan C for the bridge. Which one would you choose? And the sweet, unwilling, but willing lady said, I guess plan B, done. The League of Women Voters unknowingly voted for the Three Sisters Bridge, a very important bridge that spanned DC and is it Maryland or Virginia? I don't care where it was going from or to. It was the big bridge of great importance. Uh, two things happened with that. The main thing was against the law, the highway department, it may have been DOT, no, they, they weren't ready yet, uh, had put deep important pilings in the Potomac River to support the bridge when they could build it. And Hurricane Agnes hit Washington and wiped them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could not afford to do that over again. Uh, it was a huge, uh, it was a huge occasion, and it helped tremendously. Um, there were a lot of things about that. It it brought in again because of the consistent drawing together of organizations in the city under one guiding principle makes a huge difference. You cannot, you cannot have a city that is divided with special interests. You need to bring the citizens together. If they are not united, they can be picked off very easily. And uh, there are many points I'd like to make about that. Um, the 13 points, of course, I go back to because it was so specific. You sweet talk the so-called leaders. Mm. You buy them all. You ego trip them. Get their picture in the paper. Take them to lunch. You know, and before you know it, you've got them. And they are the ones that vote for the citizens. You're stuck. Um, around this same time, something very important happened that we're still laboring under in the district. We had wonderful citizen organizations, all black. We had very good citizens organizations, all white. Uh, we began to integrate both of them. But uh, what is most important about it is that um, they needed, they needed to have a platform. They needed to be uh, consulted, worked with, and uh, feel that their strength counted for something. And it did. It made a great deal of difference. Gradually, the citizens' organizations 
pretty much dissipated in this east of the park. The uh, civic associations became quite strong and were very important. They were very important every election that was going. And so it was in, incumbent upon us to, uh, to work hard when anyone was running for election. And of course, that, that involves the fact that we eventually got some home rule. And uh, God saw it and said it was good. Mm -hmm. So we worked with it. But um, there's so much that happens that it's hard to remember. Oh, well, I do remember. I've got the stuff here. I've got flyers all, all over the place. Little ones, big ones. Uh, you do. You do publish everything you can. You run it off. But you don't get stuck taking money. If you can possibly help, avoid grants. We would have been dead long ago if we had fallen into that trap. Some people can handle it, but I would not advise it. Seriously, I would. If you cannot bring enough courage from the citizens themselves, if they don't care enough to put muscle and some sweat into it on their own, not looking for someone to save them. But if they can't do it themselves, you, you can't win. Because you will be so bad. You, you take money and you are the whole, whether you like it or not. I know people will argue that, be my guest. I can only say that if we hadn't remained extremely careful, with the FBI against us, with a lot of people who were developers, wildly angry, and with the whole highway lobby, which was incredibly powerful and which still controls a huge, a huge amount of Congress and senators. I mean, they're really heavy. You think the gun lobby is heavy? Just take a look at the highway lobby. Truckers, truckers. They are extremely powerful, and they were fighting us from day one. And you wonder, well, why would they do that? Because their life depends on it. Their life depends on it. And uh, automobiles? Let me tell you a little story about automobiles. Everyone loves Ken Burns, right? Wonderful stuff. I just finished watching the national parks. The, the park system that we have. He did a great job. He did a great job in a lot of things. So I was very interested when he entered, not he personally, but when I was interviewed for his show on the freeway issue. I happened to be in California when it was aired, and I saw it much to my horror. It was a disaster. My relatives and friends couldn't understand what I was upset about. I said, you don't know how wrong this is. The opposition was structured as the little lady in sneakers sitting on her porch with a shotgun saying, they ain't going to take my place. You know, that kind of thing. Not intelligent, structured, informative opposition. Oh, no. No, no, no. Not that. Not the truth of what people like to think was going on. So you, you end up wondering what happened. I came back and I knew that Florentine Films always did his televising. And then I found out that General Motors had underwritten the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Trust that, right? <laughs> you think General Motors is a friend? Do you know they just did some mock-up cars, real beautiful electric cars, and they ran them around the country? Everybody got the idea, oh, General Motors is going to start doing really nice electric cars. They just did that to get you in the show. They burned, they jumped deliberately. And on the West Coast, where they weren't getting their regular freeways, they bought up the bus system, 
they had bought up the trolley system, jumped them, burned them, and got rid of them, and forced Californians into freeways. This was deliberate. This is power and money deciding how, where, and if you will live. Ralph Nader was right, unsafe at any speed. But it's kind of heartwarming to know when you watch movies on television, wherever they're from, almost always, the cops hop into a car, put on a seatbelt. So we did win that one. It's very noticeable. Just, just notice how quickly they all put on the seatbelt. If we could only do that in every other area. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Angela? I don't know. Do you have a question you want would to you, ask uh, would me? You like because to, I've uh, got loads of notes here, and I've been running over already. Angela, do you want to, um, on the uh, some of the lessons that people here in the uh, uh, well, stage well, and in the would audience you might please just tell me what it is because we, you know, this was a long time. Of what? One of the things I remember you mentioned to me is something about remember the people in, in official dumb are not your friends, and that sometimes you have to be nasty. And I think that oh, maybe paraphrase. Oh, meeting somebody had about should you be polite or should you be rude to get hold of? Am I? Can you hear me still? Sure. Should you be polite or should you be rude when you go to a public hearing? You don't have to be either one. You're firm, you know what it is you're there for, you stand for it, you answer questions. You don't have to be rude. You're just factual. You're not cowed. Don't thank them for letting you come and testify. They're there to work for you. You're just giving them credibility. No, you don't have to worry about that. If you do have some hotheads, if you do some, have some loose cannons in the organization, they can be swallowed up if the main body of the organization has credibility. Don't worry about it, because they're not going to go anywhere with their hot-headedness. It is the concerned, committed, and never-say-die people who come out on top. Um, okay, did that answer? Yeah, that would, that would be good. Okay. Well, you know, we're going to have more uh, opportunities to answer more later. Thank you very much. And, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce another of our panelists who I think, I think maybe is in the back with a little yes. one or yeah. two. Yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, she's uh, Andrea Swanson, uh, Ivy City activist. A uh, student at the uh, University of the District of Columbia, uh, and obviously a mother. And until recently, she was president of the uh, Ivy City Civic Association. And now she is treasurer, and she was succeeded by her mother, as I recall, as president. And I thought it was supposed to go the other way, that the mother hands it to the, the daughter. But, uh, and uh, she was with uh, Empower DC for about a year and a half as an organizing assistant and researcher. And I'm not sure if you have another job. Yes, I'm a teacher at an arts and technology public charter school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to say in her young life, uh, uh, well, she's not uh, going to be uh, speaking right now. Here. Okay, or did you want to? Uh, we're, we're going, uh, we're going uh, Teresa was going to speak. Okay I'll, I'll set you up should, a little bit. I'll introduce you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Get some background. So, um, Parisa Naruzi is going to be our next uh, panelist, and uh, she has over 15 years' experience working with nonprofit organizations and uh, organizing communities. After an earlier career as an organizer in the environmental movement, Parisa in 2003 co founded the citywide community organizing group Empower DC, an organization which she can describe in, in more detail when, uh, uh, when she speaks. Uh, but uh, personally, I think it's the greatest organization in DC at the present time, an amazing group. Uh, Parisa was a founding member of the uh, Ella Jo Baker Intentional Community Cooperative 
an affordable housing cooperative for community activists. She's received several awards for her work, including the Ella Baker Award, uh, awarded by Mentors of Minorities in Education, the I'll Be There Award, awarded by DC Jobs with Justice, and the Exemplary Community Activist Award, awarded by the Federation of Citizens Associations of DC. And Parisa, I turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I just found so many gems in your in your talk, Miss Rooney. So many gems that I mean, really. When I when I got here, I said to John, I wish we could spend the whole time really talking about ECTC and the, and the work that went on there because it was such a great inspiration to me. So I'm just going to briefly touch on. Um, uh, the work of Empower DC, but what I would like to say first and foremost is thank you to everybody who has been part of this type of effort over the decades. I grew up in Maryland um, and I was raised, uh, I, I became really involved as an environmental activist growing up, but when I moved into the district in the summer of 2000, um, I was working as an environmental organizer. I moved into uh, Northeast DC, 16th and D, and it was just palpable what was going on. You know, Right at that moment, the city was talking about the baseball stadium. They were talking about the Olympic bid. Um, they were talking about all sorts of development boondoggles that if you do your research, you know, don't help the people and actually just facilitate displacement. And I was in a community where folks were talking about the plan, which we don't hear about as much anymore, but it made me really curious, you know, and I wanted to find out, so what, it, what is going on here? I've never never been in a place, having grown up in the suburbs and gone to college in, in the woods <laughs> in Vermont, I had never lived in a place with that type of civic history and that type of neighborhood identity and I really wanted to understand it more. So I went searching and you know it turns out it's pretty tough to find out about local history, local civic history. Most of the good books are out of print, you know luckily there's a few things online but I, I made my way to Sam Smith. I was really lucky. I made my way to him pretty early on, and I got a copy of Captive Capital, and um, you know, learned about Julius Hobson, learned about ECTC, and learned about civic associations. And within, I was really lucky because within the first year or so of living in the district, I was um, introduced to the Ivy City Civic Association and I was introduced to Ivy City. Um, the then president, uh, Mr. R.V. Parks, who's since uh, passed on, he brought me over there to look at this cherished landmark that they have, the Alexander Cromel School, and it was the heart of the neighborhood. It was the elementary school for the community, um, and it had been closed and shuttered in the 70s and sat still vacant, despite the fact that the residents had been advocating for decades that it be restored. And it really sparked my interest, because when I was in college, I I studied public land and I was a forest activist and so I was really, I, my idea was, oh, it's public land so we have a m more say, right? <laughs> when little, you know, once you learn, oh, well, actually they engineer it so that we pay for the roads that go through the forest so that the timber companies can cut the trees and make profit and it's a similar thing that happens in the Im urban environment, right? We, this land is, is supposedly reserved for community needs yet the city just um, has this own interior process where they say they declare it surplus and they give it to a developer and lo and behold, it becomes condos. Um, but, but the training ground was Ivy City, and, and uh, one of the things that happened early on was trying to even understand the history of Ivy City, which was undocumented. You know, There was no place that you could just go and read it, so we started doing oral history interviews, much like your group is doing now, um, and uncovering some of the history and finding out that actually this was a place that had one of the most prolific and active civic associations of anywhere in the city. Their civic association was founded in 1911. At the time, uh, Ivy City was basically remote. You know, it was surrounded by woods and you know Patterson's Woods and farms. Um, there was a commuter line that went there in the, the late 1800s, but even that changed in the early 1900s and made it more remote. But these people, Deacon Crow and others who led the civic association, they, they petitioned to even have Cromel School. They had a you know small Ivy City school building, and they fought to have Cromel School. They fought to have it. Um, have decent facilities for the kids. And then I learned, well, actually the freeway was one of the things that started to erode the fabric of that community. So again, here's a community of African American people, not well-off people, but people who had a really strong, close-knit sense of community that Drea can talk about more. 
Um, but this, even just the looming threat of the freeway really started to erode some of that fabric. And then, of course, um, this neighborhood faced many other assaults that we see now happening to many other neighborhoods, like the school closure. And I don't think you can underestimate the impact of a school closure. Um, I, I certainly have been taught that by continuing today to work with Ivy City on, on a school. I work with people who went to the school in the 1930s, and they're still fighting to see their school restored. Um, but here we are today, since 2008. Does anybody know how many schools have closed? Mucho. 40 schools since 2008. That's not even a decade. 40 schools, right? And they're rapidly being used as tools for neighborhood change or, you know, to displace, to, to change the, the, the existing character of the neighborhood to usher in new people. For many years, inspired by Cromel School, and, and honestly, Empower DC was inspired by Ivy City. You know, at the time I was working in Ivy City, Empower DC did not exist, and I thought, okay, an organization needs to exist whose purpose is to assist residents with fight organizing so that they can have some self-determination in what's happening in their neighborhoods. Displacement being the biggest issue in the city, really, still today, development and displacement. Um, but I started to look at, okay, what's happening to these other school buildings, and you know, most of the historic school buildings have become not just housing, but the highest cost housing in the city. Is anybody familiar with the Wormley School in Georgetown? Condos starting at $1.4 million. That's when it opened, you know, closer to 10 years ago. The Pierce School, the Lovejoy School, you know, the list goes on and on. And then not just schools, but even some other facilities like, um, well, it was part of the school, Mather Building, which was part of UDC, across from Martin Luther King uh, Library, condos, you know, the Giddings School, which is a results gym on Capitol Hill, I'm sure you've seen it. So, and then looking at the law and finding out that they're saying, the city is saying, no further public use. These are declared surplus. We have no use for these buildings, which of course, any one of us in this room could talk about, you know, dozens of uses that are needed and come to find out the city is, is giving our land to the developers and then doing a double giveaway by then renting space from them for civic purposes. So at the time, you know, we were paying $150 million a year in rent to developers for office space for DC government. I don't know what the figure is today. Um, but so these are the, these, how do we save a neighborhood is the <laughs> title of the, 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 the theme tonight. And I, you know, I wish there was an easy um, formula, but um, I do want to say a couple things. You know, right now we're working it with public housing communities who are facing their, you know, complete extinction. And that is the purpose, the, the, when the city says, oh, we're going to have one-to-one -one replacement and people are going to come back, that's not what happens. <laughs> that's not the purpose of the city, that's not their goal, and that's not what happens. Now, if they wanted people not to be displaced, they could develop in a way that didn't displace people. They could keep the people in place. And as long as, as we've found time and time again that when you move, it's very unlikely you'll come back. Um, one of our leaders, you know, she says, uh, there's no hope in Hope 6. You know, that was the former program. There's no choice in choice communities, which is what they started <laughs> calling it. And now they want to call it, they want to build a new community, which is what they call it now. But we already have a community here, you know. And really what folks want is just some investment in uh, improving conditions. The city has treated uh, these areas like, like a slum landlord. And, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell you all, convince you all, that we desperately need affordable housing in the District of Columbia. You know, uh, earlier this year, they closed the waiting list for affordable housing, but there was 70,000 people on it. We have... Um, hundreds of families waiting for emergency shelter. You know, so you're on a waiting list six months for emergency shelter. You're waiting maybe 20 years for a housing voucher. Um, and uh, the, they say now that you have to earn $29 an hour to afford the average rental unit. So you know, when the mayor vetoes the Living Wage Act, which was only gonna give some people 1250 maybe in uh, salary and benefits, um, you know, we really have to question, you know, who, who does he want to exist in this city? Certainly not many of the people who built this town and stood beside it all of these years. 
Um, just in closing, I know Andrea is going to talk more uh, specifically about the, um, the, the stuff going on in Ivy City. And we do have two really important things coming up. On Saturday, we have a, a summit about saving our schools. And on Tuesday, we are in court um, for the uh, Ivy City case. Um, and just a couple of the um, sort of principles that some of which echo what Ms. Rooney was saying completely, but you know, join an organization. I, I would encourage people to join their civic association. I've been part of the federation, and I have to say, you know, we, we need more people <laughs> involved, definitely. Form alliances like uh, you were talking about, start at the neighborhood level. And I was, you know, you were talking about 22 years of fighting on the, it takes time. It takes a lot of time, you know, and, and I have to remember that. It's been 10 years with Empower DC. I've been working with Ivy City for 12 years, and then I remind myself, well, they've been working on this for 30 years, you know, so it takes time, but it's going to happen eventually. Um, the whole question about, you know, whether or not to use confrontation, because we're always, uh, Empower DC has this reputation in the city, and some people like to say, you know, how out of hand we are, and we, we disrupt meetings, and <laughs> we only do that because we're forced to, because we request meetings and are, you know, denied, because we give public input and public testimony and are ignored, and, um, you know, use confrontation when necessary, because we have to make it hard for them. You, we have to have strong principles, and we don't want to come out of the gate compromising, you know, like you said, not one inch of freeway. You have to have strong principles, and, and certainly, you know, some of the issues that we're up against, it's hard to stop a moving train, but at least we got to make it hard for them. Um, and um, I really want to see that 13 steps to change the neighborhood around. Uh, but this issue of, um, you know, how, how people get bought off is, uh, it's really prevalent. It's really, really prevalent. I mean, I have, you know, I've had staff people <laughs> getting personal calls from, from council people, you know, trying to basically sweet talk them into coming to their side, coming to work for them or, or whatever. So um, I, again, I just want to thank everybody for the work that they've done. We, we hope in our small way to be continuing the, the fight. And uh, for those who do want to stay in touch with me, please get my card or, or sign up so that I can keep in touch. Uh, just say a few more things in introduction to uh, Andrea Swanson uh, from Ivy City. Uh, she uh, certainly has emerged as a driving force to protect her uh, Ivy City community where her family has deep roots uh, going back generations. And I just want to read this one thing from her uh, LinkedIn page on the internet which expresses her activism over issues of environment, environmental racism and uh, gentrification this way. I am actively working toward creating social change. I feel like I am the hope of my ancestors and the work I do as an organizer. And that gives me the motivation to keep pushing against socially accepted wrongs and injustices in my community. Besides being a mother, the most important thing to me is to preserve my culture and history. So Andrea, good to have you here tonight. And Thank you. Thanks. It's a really good quote. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's I thought, on my LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, yes, and honestly, even just I, I, thinking about it and uh, listening to, I'm sorry, because I didn't get Miss Rooney. Miss Miss Rooney. Yeah. Twenty-two years of fighting. It. I feel like thinking about Ivy City. It hurts my heart. These these things hurt me emotionally. I'm saddened by them. I'm I'm disappointed. I'm I'm confused as to why. You know, we have council. We have representatives who are not representing us. Um, they are not representing the interests of the people, our lives, our families, um, the, the, our lifestyles, having jobs and being able to provide. And so it confuses me and it also hurts me because then there isn't as much organization. There aren't as many people. So I, I wanted to ask, how did you get keep people involved for 22 years? Mm -hmm. Because I struggle trying to keep people involved for two weeks. It's so hard. You know, people, they feel like, oh, I'm going through this. I can't pay this bill. My electric is cut off. I'm going through this. So I just can't be involved in coming to these meetings. I can't be involved in testifying. It's frustrating. I'm frustrated. I have a lot going on. I'm a mom of two. My son is seven months. My daughter is three. I'm in school taking classes. I'm working full time, but I am committed. I read a quote that said that, uh, and it's not exact, and it was unknown, but when you're interested, interested in something, 
you know, once you fulfill that interest, you want to move on to the next thing. But when you're committed to something, that commitment does not end. I'm committed to my children. I'm committed to my education. I'm committed to my community. I'm committed to my culture. It's a commitment, not an interest. You know, interest, you peak it, you fulfill it, it's gone. But when you're committed to something, that can last a lifetime. I just want to say the work in Ivy City, uh, Parisa said it, 30 years, my grandparents, my grandmother and my grandfather were fighting this fight. They had May Day on Cromwell School. The school was closed, by the way, already. They were having events on, um, holding events. My grandfather was taking the community children on trips down to the monument, to the FBI building, to the Smithsonian Museums. And they were fighting and they were saying, we need this open. Our children need a place in the community. Never happened. They reopened it as a preschool for a short while. And my mom attended the preschool and then it was burned down. When I grew up in Ivy City, um, I'm the third generation. My children are the fourth in this community. Been a very long time. Uh, I had nowhere to play. I got into so much trouble as a child because there was nothing to do in the community. And so coming back to Ivy City, I moved back to Ivy City when I was 20. I moved back um, in with my grandmother, pregnant with my daughter. And I, I, I honestly have to say, I, was, I had no intentions. I never knew how what was going on in my surroundings. I didn't learn about council members and I didn't learn about testimonies until I was 20 years old. When I moved back with my grandmother, she'd sit on the couch, she watched the news all day, this going on, that's going on. And Parisa used to come and knock on my grandmother's door giving flyers and um, giving information. And my grandmother said, you know, we fought this for it. My grandmother told me a story about her protesting, about her getting beat up on a sit-in, about how her and my grandfather were fighting hard for Cremel School to be reopened. And she ignited a spark that has now, it's, it's just a fire ablaze in me. Um, and I, I really know that it was, it's my grandmother in me. It's her working through me now. She recently passed um, in September. And she still stays with me. She, she encouraged me. She said, Dre, I, I need you to get involved. I'm too old to do it. I'm too weak to do it. So since then, I hit the ground running. I, I began volunteering. I was volunteering as secretary for the Ivy City Civic Association. And we were just coming back together, just um, beginning to form again. So it was new. It was a lot of fresh spaces. I said, good. I'm here. I'm doing this. At first, it was really just for my grandmother. I said, mm -hmm. she don't. She want me to do something. I'm going to do it because I love her so much that I said, I'm going to do it because she asked me to do it. And I loved her. Um, so I, I was volunteering and then I started to learn things. Parisa and I, I give a lot of credit to Empower DC for helping reorganize our civic association and educating me on these things because I had no idea about it. I lived in DC my whole life and I just went to the Wilson Building when I was 20. That could just tell you much of the life I was living in before that. It was, it's really different living in poverty and coming from uh, communities where they are low income. Uh, it is according to your income. We don't, you don't think about those things. You, you, you know, people out hanging out, we partying. People are so stressed that they're only looking for something to relieve that stress. And it may be drugs, it may be alcohol, it may be getting into trouble, which I did a lot of that as a, as a young uh, girl. I still was very smart, didn't ever mess up in school. I graduated from Duke Ellington, spent a year in California, went to Rutgers University. But when I was home, I was getting in trouble. It wasn't the good things. So I was so happy that my grandmother just said get involved because ever since then, it opened my eyes to a new world in D.C. that I didn't know about before. Growing up and being raised in D.C., going to places that I haven't been to that tourists go to all the time. So I just said, you know what, I have to, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the Harriet Tubman of my time and I'm going to go back and I'm going to educate others. Because it's no, it's no one else doing that. No one, when they, People get educated, they go out, they get their education, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm done with that, they poor, I don't have anything to do with that. They don't go back, and they don't educate. Just like Miss Rooney, right? Miss Rooney coming back, educating us, lessons of the 60s. I'm learning so much, and it helps, and it helps to further our campaign and what we're doing in our fight in Ivy City. I'm learning. And that's coming back and giving the education back to people who don't know anything about it, or who does, who does not have in the outlet to learn about it. We have, everyone has internet. No, people say that all the time. Mm -hmm. No, everyone doesn't have internet. A lot of the people that I've lived with in the hood, 
People don't have internet. They cannot afford it. They don't have laptops. They don't have iPads. They don't, they just don't. They may have a little cell phone. So everything is not accessible to everyone. And I think people forget that. And then they may pass that judgment like, oh, well, they can learn and they can get a foot up. Not everyone is able because they don't think it. As a man thinketh, so is he. If they don't think about it or think beyond their surroundings or beyond their issues, they won't know. So I just was very happy to get involved with the Civic Association and also very discouraged as well because they attack us. We had Michael Durso, Victor Hoskins, Victor Hoskins coming to meetings telling us this is what we're gonna do in your community and it's nothing you can do about it. From the very beginning, they said we are coming and we're gonna make your precious Cromel School a bus depot and it's nothing you can do about it. As a child, I seen Cromel, I feel like Cromel has been violated. Everything that it stood for in our community, um, everyone always say Cromel embodied Ivy City, the spirit of Ivy City, it was everything to us and they just made it, uh, they had a car, they had a car lot, they were selling cars, it was an auction. Love Nightclub for years did not pay the city a dime, but they charged people $30 to park. And if you know Love Nightclub, they have all types of celebrities and rappers and even council members have their birthday parties there. Mm -hmm. they, they are very connected. And, and they did not pay a dime and they used it as a parking lot and it was even more disturbing to the residents because we're like, what is going on? We can't use it, but this nightclub in our community can use it who gives nothing back. It was, it, it, it hurt me to know that they, they attacked us from the very beginning. They came at us hard, like, no, you don't have a say. We are gonna do this. Um, but, I mean, what do you want out of the deal? Pretty much, that's kind of like, you know, it's gonna be a bus depot. And we were like, no, that's not what we want. Well, they like, well, you know, this is what it is. They went through with their paperwork. They started building on our Cromel School lot and they hadn't even went to our ANC. Yes, our ANC was at our community meeting when you said, oh, we making it a bus depot. That was not ANC notice. Y'all did not give the 30, no 30 days notice in the register <laughs> like you're supposed to legally. <laughs> they didn't even go through that process. They didn't say, oh, well, we would like your community input. What would you like to see in Ivy City? They said, this is what we're gonna do. And we're like, well, why did you build these homes? Why did you spend money with Mana and Mikasa and Habitat? You said, well, you're gonna revitalize Ivy City. And in that plan, it said, we are gonna restore Cromel School. And they did none of that. They built the homes, they invited these new families. They said, we're gonna have these affordable um, homes for families, come to Ivy City. It's the next thing, they had signs up that said Ivy City. And then they decided that with these new mortgages, one of the, uh, my neighbors, Patty Lewis, she entered like a 30 year mortgage, 15 year mortgage. And her daughter has asthma, chronic asthma, and they wanna put a bus depot literally across the street from her house. So she entered this and she came with those advertisements that said Ivy City is the next big thing. We have all these affordable homes and they're beautiful homes, beautiful condos but they're not doing anything else in the community to help the people, to uplift the people, to educate the people. Um, they closed our Webb Elementary, I attended Webb Elementary School, and so the children have to walk through, cr cross so many streets, and into another neighborhood just to go to school. Um, and I feel like too, when they closed the Cromel School, it disheartened our community so much that it has been a constant downfall since then. We were hit with so many different blights since then. And I think that if had the Cromel School stayed open, it would be a lot different right now. Um, nevertheless, to say, I'm gonna jump ahead back further into mm -hmm. these meetings with the, and so back then it was Kwame Brown we were meeting with and he was coming and he was like, yes, I understand what you guys are saying but it wasn't really no resolution. It was like, we hear you. Okay, bus is coming soon. <laughs> and, and we, I mean, it was nothing we can do. Oh, you want a rec center? Okay, we're gonna park the buses there first for the first five years, and then we'll talk about you guys having a rec center. Every plan, the greening plan, the comprehensive plan, even the grant, a federal grant they applied for when they wanted to build the affordable home said that they were gonna restore Cromel School. So they lied to get federal money, and they did not restore the school. They haven't. The school has been falling apart. They haven't even replaced the tarp on the school since Empower DC first advocated for the tarp in the first place. There has been so many storms. There has been cords falling. So, you know, we have, this is deterioration by neglect. They completely neglected the school. And the way they built, they like, put pavement around the school for these buses. And 
it, mm-hmm. when it storms, when it rains, I'm pretty sure the basement is already flooded. It's in such horrible condition. It's so crazy because we've been trying to get into the school for years, and as soon as some foreign developer comes to D.C., uh, the new Michael Derso, which I always, Rodney George. Mm-hmm. I call him the new Michael Derso. <laughs> <laughs> but he's in, uh, he's, he's with the planning, uh, economic planning and development. They allow these foreign developers to enter our precious Cromwell school, and we've been trying to get in for the past 30 years. We've been trying to get in and restore and rebuild, and they allow these developers to go inside the building just to see inside the school. There are still banners hanging up on the school walls from the students that attended that school in the wow. 70s. There are, there's still things on the chalkboards, and it, and it looks, you know, it's, it's, it's really rusty. It's really, it's damaged. It looks like it's about to fall apart at any time but it's still strong. And Cromwell School is the heart of our community. I don't even want to say was because it's not open. It is. It is the reason why we're still fighting. And it's so hard. So many Ivy City residents, they have been disheartened. So bad, so much so that they don't even want anything to do with Cromwell. It's so sad. We're fighting the fight and it's pretty much like five of us. No, we're down to three. It's down to three of us, and uh, two of us is me and my mom and a new resident. And we're the only ones really now fighting the fight, but it's not even, the, it's not even how many of us it is, because I think at first it was like five of us. It's how much noise we're making. They see us everywhere. We're in the Wilson building. We're calling, setting up meetings. Um, we even did a, a drive to register people to vote. When they seen that we were getting people to register to vote, they wanted to come to Ivy City. They said, okay, we have voters now because our, our voting statistics were really horrible prior to that. No one was coming out. It's just people were not, they're so discouraged. They don't want anything to do. They don't believe in the council members. They don't believe in the system and the people that are supposed to be representing us. We are not being represented at all. They are represented by dollar signs. And we're coming from a neighborhood where the area median income is 22000 We don't have no money for you. But our taxes are paying for you to be in that position. And so, you know, you owe us a community where we can thrive, where our children can be educated, where we can feel safe. And so I'll, I will continue this fight. I was just like, you know what, I'm ready. Let's go for it. Reese said, let's file a lawsuit. I said, I'll, I'll be the first one. I'll get up there, put my name down. I will sue the mayor. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yes, it, it, it can go down. I'm not afraid. And honestly, it seemed like after that, I was being attacked. Um, they try to do things behind the scenes to put you out. Some things about my past came out and then they want to send me notices in the mail. And I'm like, well, it wasn't ever a problem before. You know, I've made a transition from that time and I'm a different person now and I'm much older. I was young, I made mistakes. But those things came out, you know. They want to know who Andrea Swanson is. People who comment on the Washington Post comments, they say a lot of nasty and negative things. And I'm just like, wow, you know, I'm so surprised that they don't know me and that you're taking sides for people who are not even representing any of us. Mm -hmm. Um, I honestly think that the entire council at this point, I think everyone behind the scenes is crooked. Mm -hmm. They are corrupted. They're looking for money. And they're not really looking out for the people, especially with so much of the displacement going on. Personally, even myself, I'm going through, it's really hard to find housing in D.C. I work, I'm a teacher now, and it's still really hard to afford to live here. And I've been here my whole life. I refuse to be pushed out. They're going to have to come very hard and very strong to get me out of D.C. I love my city. I love being here. My family, uh, everyone I've known has lived in this area. And so continuing this fight, it's so funny that we made it to the injunction. Um, Judge Makalusu ruled in our favor. No, you didn't go to the ANC, you didn't give notice, um, and so we're gonna uphold it. You cannot park those buses in that community. And the mayor decided to appeal the decision of a judge from his constituents. You are appealing and saying, no, you know, these are the constituents in my city, but I'm still gonna go against them and go a step above them. And he appealed the case, the judge ruled in our favor. We won, we were so happy, ANC Commissioner um, Bennett, uh, also, test, I mean, was also one of the plaintiffs, as well as Jeanette Carter, who lived in the community for a very long time, was very close with my grandmother, was like an aunt to me as a child. And we won. And you still are telling us, no, you cannot have your Cromwell school under any circumstance. We're going to appeal that decision. And I just feel like if we have a mayor 
who would appeal a decision for a small community, and it was only three of us that, that were plaintiffs in the case, um, and he had like 13 lawyers mm -hmm. against our one lawyer. No, seriously, it was yeah. like yeah. 13 lawyers lined up, and then uh, he even they hired. Had to get a block the end. Yeah, they they uh, they hired an additional lawyer mm -hmm. toward the end just to make it, I guess, balance out. It just was ridiculous, and I was like, they're going through all of this using our taxpayer dollars, remind you, mm -hmm. to to counter taxpayers mm -hmm. <laughs> and this fight. Um, and so it really just baffled me. I honestly don't think at all that he should be in a position to be our mayor because at right now and everything that he's been doing has been showing that he has he doesn't care about what you what you want in your community what you need in your community mm -hmm. to help it um to build it and to help it grow so now we're headed into appeals court against the mayor and um i'm looking forward to the judge also ruling in our favor again that's right yeah. <laughs> Yes. yes, September 17th, um, and at the D.C. Court of Appeals, we need to pack the courtroom. We need a lot of support. If you are available, it's at 9.30 a.m. I don't know which courtroom. The flyer's right okay, there. Okay, the flyer's right there. If you can make it, we need as much support as we can get. Uh, it, it's just ridiculous that he even appealed the decision. And I want to also say, too, you said that uh, they had like a lot of powerful people behind them. What's the board, the Union Station, the board, the Union Station board? Mm -hmm. um, Redevelopment Corporation. The, yeah, Union Station Redevelopment Corporation, not them. The one that Mayor Anthony Williams, he's on the board. Oh, a federal city council. Federal city council is behind it, I know. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a lot of powerful and behind the scenes people mm -hmm. pushing this as well. And I think they're putting a lot of pressure as well. As Union Station, everyone knows Union Station is going through this big redevelopment. And that has a lot to do with it as well. So it's a lot of federal and our, uh, oh, I don't know, what's it, I forgot what's it called, I'm sorry. What's it? I'm losing it right now. Uh, I forgot her name, we didn't know what it's on. North? Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's Ms. so useless to us. I am. She is, it was so <laughs> ridiculous, Norton, you know, she she tried to say, oh, it's yeah, this is federal land, but it's it's the job the job is given to the city, it's the city's responsibility. But we know that it's federal, they're pushing it. And she says, you know, I don't want to be misrepresented, I don't want to get into city things because then I will I will be misrepresented when I'm on the federal handling things on the federal side in Congress. She said that she did not want to get involved, that she was not involved, but we know that she also has a seat on the federal city council as well. Um, but she definitely denied getting involved in anything. So she said that's the city responsibility. Yes, it's it's you know federal money involved, and yes, it's some federal interest behind it. But it's the city's responsibility, and I will have nothing to do with it. So I was just very, very surprised, especially because Congressman Norton, I've for a long time, she's always been our congressman. I looked up to her at one point because I do plan to go to law school thanks to Johnny Barnes. <laughs> I'm very interested to, to know what is going on. A lot of people that run this country, they're lawyers and businessmen. And I want to know what they're thinking when they're creating these legislations and what they think we don't know. Mm. Okay. okay. Well, Thank you.